I know we're down to the very end of the semester here, but I'm, I'm really excited to be able to make today's introduction to you. This is kind of, I, I personally think this is the uh, high point of the lecture series. And you know, um, it's been a pretty good series um, up till now. So uh, I'm about to introduce to you Vineet Nair, who um, I'm going to give you a little background here. Um, uh, probably most well known for being CEO of HCL Technologies from uh, 2007 to uh, 2013. And this is a company, uh, it's a $5.5 .5 billion global technology service firm. Uh, it has a $19 plus billion market capitalization. It's a, it's a large company. And he has an incredible um, and impressive story about how uh, he's been through the transformation of that company. Um, he's the author of a book called Employees First, get it exactly right, Employees First, Customers Second, Turning Conventional Wisdom Upside Down. And you know this documents the story of HCL and, and what happened. And people say amazing things about uh, Nai, uh, Vineet Nair. Um, one, it, you know, things like um, he, he could potentially be the next Peter Drucker. And if you don't know Peter Drucker, that <laughs> it's a good thing. He, he's like the world's expert in, uh, you know, laying the foundations of management. Um, he's uh, on the uh, uh, Thinkers 50 list in 2012, CEO of the year in 2011. He's also been an entrepreneur. He founded Comnet in 1993, which is a billion dollar firm. And last but not least, he's also a philanthropic leader. A philanthropic leader. Um, he founded Sam Park Foundation, Sam Park Foundation uh, in 2004 with his wife, and it transforms the lives of children and adults largely through education. So I'm really happy to uh, be able to uh, host you, um, uh, Vinit, on this stage. Thank you. Okay. So good evening. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> Sorry? Life. Fire. He says life, I think. Life, OK. What about life you want to talk about? How was your life? How was my life? OK. What else do you want to talk about? How did you get into Thinkers 50 list? How did I get into Thinkers 50? Fluke. <laughs> OK. What else do you want to talk about? What about entrepreneurship? How to be an entrepreneur. You want to be an entrepreneur, and therefore you want to hear about? What, what do you want to know about innovation? What makes an innovator? What makes an innovator? OK, what else? How to think differently. How to think differently? OK, what, what else do you want? What are my successes and failures, and why is that important for you? Because I can really learn from them. Okay. What else do you want to talk about? How you became an entrepreneur. How did I become an entrepreneur? OK, good. What else? Anything else? Management. Management? Who said that? What do you want to know about that? Uh, basically, how do, you, how do you start as a junior level employee at a company and make your way up? Make your way up. You know, what did we, do, what did we just do right now? No? We start with questions and not start with answers. So whenever you want to try and, you know, whenever you consider a question that why are so few people successful and so many not, why would you say that Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi were successful and so many others attempted similar things are not? Or why would Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, and some of the other leaders called successful and others not? What differentiates them compared to the others? Is the single thought of the fact that they start at a different point compared to everybody else. And that different point is a question. The different point is not that I have an answer and therefore let me try and search for a question. The different point is what is the question you need to ask? 
There's a very interesting story which I will start the session with, uh, which has inspired me quite a lot in my thinking. And this is a true story of a boy in Shanghai. And this boy had only one arm. But his aspiration was that he wanted to fight judo. He wanted to play judo. And not only he wanted to learn judo, he also wanted to compete in tournaments. And therefore, he went from one coach to another coach to say, hey, can you teach me judo? And obviously, every single coach would tell him that judo is meant for people with two arms. And fortunately, you have only one arm. And therefore, no. But his aspiration was so high that he kept on experimenting with one coach after another till he found one coach and he said yes. And that coach started training him and then this guy goes into the tournament. In the tournament he wins the first round, the second round, the semi-finals and then in his one hand he held the trophy, he had won the trophy. And every single person out there was surprised in terms of what had just happened. The guy who was rejected by everybody else and with only one arm had suddenly won the trophy. And then they asked this coach, this coach in terms of, how do you explain what happened? And he says, all of you were asking the wrong question. All of you were asking, what did he not have? And I was asking, what did he have? In judo, in there is one attacking move. When you attack an opponent, the only counter to that move is to catch hold of the right arm of your opponent and spin him around. And since this guy has no right arm, there's no counter to that move. And therefore, there was always all the opportunity for him to win the tournament, period. So I think the important lesson in life is that whenever you look at small or large anecdotes, and we will talk of some of them, they are all originate from a different thought. The origination point of those are different. And therefore, the first thing which you need to do about innovation, about entrepreneurship, about management, about anything which you wish to do, is to start from a different point. Start thinking from a different point. You know, let us start with a definition. And this is the only management gyan I will give in the next 30 seconds, and after that, I will move away from it. But this definition is very important. The definition of a high-performance individual, right? Now, high-performance individuals are those who do stuff which others consider impossible. If there is one quote you wish to write and put it on your study table, this is what it should be. High-performance individuals are those who do stuff which others consider impossible. It is not impossible, but others consider impossible. And once they do it, then everybody copies. Whether it's to do with high jumps, for the first time the black flip, the back flip came in, nobody thought about it till one person did it, and then everybody copied, and suddenly the high jumps uh, bars got raised, or it is with business. So the first time the guy does it, everybody considers, considers that impossible, and then everybody follows it. So the definition of a high-performance individual is a guy who does stuff which others consider impossible. From this definition originates two little thoughts. Number one, how much time do you spend doing impossible stuff? Because if you're not spending time doing impossible stuff, impossible stuff is not gonna happen. Remember, the limitation in life for everybody is time. So if you were to do a two by two matrix of time on one side and the impact you create on the other side, if you look at the amount of time you're spending on activities which are creating low impact versus on activities which are creating high impact, successful high performance individuals are able to manage to spend maximum amount of their time on activities which create high impact. And what are those activities? We'll talk about that. So that's the first little question in terms of you will not create impossible stuff unless you spend significant amount of time thinking, doing about impossible stuff. The second is a more interesting question in terms of what is impossible and how do I train myself to create impossible? How do I train myself to think impossible? And the easy answer to that is, for me at least, that when you look at a magician, right? A magician performs a trick. And when a magician performs a trick, you call it impossible, unbelievable. He sliced somebody in, two, in half or somebody started flying in the air, impossible. 
So the definition of impossible or a definition of a magical movement is what is outside your boundaries of logic and reason. That is not outside the boundaries of logic and reason of the magician, it is outside your boundaries of logic and reason. So therefore, if you want to do, if you want to be a high performance individual, you want to do the impossible stuff, you have to spend a significant amount of time thinking outside the boundaries of logic and reason. And how do you think about outside the boundaries of logic and reason? We'll come to that. But I think it is very important for you to establish that fact in your mind that if every day you are not thinking about it, you are not going to be able to do it. The way our brain works, my, my thesis, is that knowledge sets into our brain very easily. So our new quantum physics formula or a new thermodynamics issue will settle, that knowledge will settle into our brain very easily. But we have muscles in our brain. And those muscles on the brain are meant to apply that knowledge to real world problems. So if you apply that knowledge to real world problems in an innovative fashion, outside the boundaries of logic and reason, exactly the way that coach applied for that one-armed boy, you would be successful. You would be an innovator. You would be an entrepreneur. You would be everybody. So unless you train yourself from fairly early stages to start thinking about things differently, start doing things differently. Why am I sitting? Why am I not standing? You know, the whole lot of things. It's, it's, if you start exercising your muscle differently every time, then when the real opportunity comes in front of you, you will respond to that differently. Now, whenever you look at, when, even when you look at Facebook or any of these new experimental you know, organizations which have been created over the last decade. The reason I'm called them experimental is because they have, you know, they have been successful only for a decade. For real success, you have to look at at least a couple of decades put together. But one common thing about these experimental organizations which have been hugely successful is because it is not the idea, the, the singular you know, complexity of the idea, but the beauty and the simplicity of the idea which has made it different. So they have applied their muscle to a business issue differently compared to the way others have applied themselves to. So what we conclude here is that high performance people or high performance individuals who wish to be innovators, who wish to be businessmen, successful businessmen, who wish to be independent in, you know, in, in what they are attempting to do, have to find ways of exercising their muscles outside the boundaries of logic and reason. Now let me give you two examples of where I exercise my, my mind, my muscles outside the boundaries of logic and reason, and then we will go into a Q&A very quickly and see if we can develop some of these arguments and relate them to you rather than anybody else. So let me take three examples. So when I was in college, I did my first startup. And that startup was quite a stupid startup. It was a nail polish remover like Revlon. You put your finger in, you rub it, and out comes and the nail polish is removed. And the girls in my college were pretty happy. I was pretty popular. The only thing is, and a friend of mine was a chemical engineer, the only thing is we discovered that we had not done research on the chemical part of it, and therefore the skin also started coming out. <laughs> but the very fact that we exercise in our muscle at very early stages, right, to try and see if we can make startup, and we made a lot of money out of that. A lot of money means at that particular time, enough to drink alcohol every day. That was, you know. That was, that was good money. That our, our, our mind started exercising and we, we could quickly discover what was good and what was bad about the startup which we did. And that led, led to the, my first startup which I did in 1993. Now the first startup when we did in 1993 which grew to 1.4 billion dollars in size was very interestingly based on the fact that IP was coming in as a protocol just about that particular time. And while everybody was looking at IP as a communication protocol, we were looking at it as a management protocol. That more and more unmanaged devices were getting managed, were becoming managed devices, and if they were becoming managed devices, can we manage them remotely? So we launched what we call a new, a completely new paradigm, a platform to be able to manage scatter devices, pumps, you know, all, all the complex devices remotely from a, from a network operating center, which is now very common. But we started it in 1993, just about when Cisco was coming in, all riding on the IP technology. So the first innovation came in purely based on our experiment in the college on, a, on what I call a product access, right? 
a, a disruptive trend is happening, you apply the disruptive trend not in the area which everybody is applying it, but you apply the disruptive trend in a different area. So that, that in my mind was an easier one. It had its own ups and downs, but we were successful. The second innovation was a little more complex. It was that in 2005, when I came to HCL Technologies, we were about 30,000 people, employees, about $700 million in, in, uh, in revenues, and we were losing mind share, market share, and talent share. So the question is, when uh, there is a very interesting study done by McKinsey, which you should always remember the statistics. They did a study across 30 years of listed Fortune 500 companies and came to a conclusion that once you lose market share in the market, the probability of you winning back is only 4%. So 96% of the companies would lose, if they lose market share, then they permanently lose market share. Therefore, the first opportunity is you should never lose market share. However, therefore, what you see is you see extremely very few turnaround situations. There is only 1% of the company, so there are 4% of the companies who have been able to regain their market share, and there is only 1% of the companies who have been able to go beyond their original market share. So the probability of a success of a turnaround is very limited. So when I came into HCL Technologies in 2005, the probability of success of a turnaround of HCL Technologies from a me too company to be a cutting edge innovation was 1%. So the way we thought about it, again, you know, developing our muscle which we talked about is, that should we innovate on the product axis? And, and the answer to that question was that there was so much innovation on the product axis which everybody had done that the whole service industry had become commodity and there is very limited work which you could, which you could do on that axis. Therefore, we said, can, is there an, another axis of innovation? Let's step back and look at Steve Jobs very carefully. Steve Jobs was actually, in my analysis, not an innovation on what axis. The product is not great. But the experience of using the product is great. So therefore, he actually created a completely new axis called experience. And because of creating a new axis, you know, the entire world adopted it. So we said, actually, it is not about what you do in a company, but about how you do in a company. And therefore, if you can energize the employees and motivate them, and the management can be accountable to the employees, rather than just the employees being accountable to the management, you will unleash the kind of energy in the organization which nobody else has seen before. So my appraisal was done by 100,000 employees across 32 countries, and the results of that appraisal were publicly demonstrated to all employees, and that was true with 6,000 other employees. So initiatives like this created what we call the concept of employee first, customer second. Innovate not on the axis of what you do, but how you do it, which resulted into a seven-fold increase in market cap, revenues, profitability, and all that stuff. So that was the second innovation experiment which we did, which was hugely successful, and that idea was create a new axis. The third innovation experiment which we are currently undertaking is of a completely different muscle category. So this innovation was that when me and my wife stepped out and said, hey, we want to do something for the society. Now, I don't know how many of you know, you know, right in your area is one of the most biggest, the best innovator, innovation mind, I would say, is Tim Brown from IDEO. And he was a very close friend of mine. And we used to talk about why innovation is not being applied to social sector. Social sector seems to be all about the heart, right? I feel for you and so many poor children and so many, uh, so many people who don't have it. Or It's all about the heart. It's not about the mind. Whereas the business is nothing about the heart. It's all about the mind. This is also wrong. But can we bring some mind to the innovation and can we innovate in social sector? So we set up a challenge for ourselves that can we drive large-scale social change through innovation. And we came up with this idea called $1 experiment. So this dollar experiment was, can we reach million, 1 million children in primary schools of rural India and teach them English and maths through teachers who can't speak English and don't know maths? And can we change the statistics? The statistics in India is 86% of grade five children in rural government schools can't add or subtract, right, of grade five. So can we turn that statistics around 
only by spending a dollar per annum per child. As we speak today, Sampark Foundation is the foundation me and my wife run, have reached 3 million children at dollar per child per annum and teach them English and maths in primary school through 200,000 teachers in 50,000 remote rural schools by bringing innovation in the way transaction happens between the teacher and the student. And we are not getting into the details of what happens unless you are interested about that. But the core point I'm trying to make is when you look at the social innovation, people will tell you all the constraints. The governments are not interested, the teachers are not interested, the students are not interested, nobody will cooperate, it will take too much money, it will take too much time, and we reached three million in three years. And by the time I come back, after two years, we, will, we would have reached 10 million. So the question is, when you look at all the constraints, the reason people have not adopted large-scale social change as a campaign is because they always get afraid of working with the government. And whenever we, we, they, we, we, from our point of view, whenever there are such challenges, there are opportunities. You know, that is the reason when a diamond cutter sees a rough diamond, he sees an opportunity. If he sees a polished diamond, he doesn't see an opportunity. Whenever a potter sees rough clay, he sees an opportunity. Similarly, whenever an innovator sees a challenge, whenever an innovator sees a lot of constraint, he can understand that people have not applied their mind. Because if they had applied their mind, they can think beyond this constraint and create a completely new innovation. So to summarize what I'm saying is that innovation, entrepreneurship, business creation, value creation, high performance is all what you can learn. It is not that somebody is born with it and somebody is not born, it, born with it. I think all you can learn. It is definitely about exercising your muscle to come up with an idea which nobody else has or exercise your muscle and come up with an, not an idea but the implementation of an idea in a way that nobody else has done or come up with an idea of overcoming constraints because of which nobody else has done what should have been done. So if you can exercise your muscle in any of these three axes and convert a threat into an opportunity, at that is the time you will be what I call a very successful high performance individual. So that's what I want to talk about today. And now we can take the conversation anywhere you wish it to go. Over to you. Okay, so, so let's take this challenge, right? Let's exercise our muscle a little here. I, do you want to do that? Okay. So how, so let's assume that there are three million children who can't speak two words of English. And these three million children are in 50,000 schools. And you have 200,000 teachers teaching these three million children in 50,000 schools. The only constraint is these three million children, these, these 200,000 teachers can't speak English. Can you tell me one way you will teach English to these three million children? By applying the constraint of a dollar, the moment I apply the constraint of a dollar, you can't take your laptops to school, right? And the reason you can't take the laptop to school is predominantly because there's no electricity in those schools. So how would you teach English to three million children through 200,000 teachers who cannot speak English. Let's go crazy, let's apply our mind. Yes. TV, TV there is no electricity, I said. Do? Do the teachers have electricity? At their home, okay, yes, maybe. But for one hour a day, yes. Okay, it's train the teachers on a television at their home, and they train come, good, good. Okay, let's, let's pro keep on progressing, okay, good. But would that fit, does it, how much does the television cost? $500, and a teacher typically teaches 30 children, will not fit into the dollar. But still, we have made progress, right? Okay, what more, yes? Sorry? English book. So teacher can't read English. So 
it's like, it's like, I don't know, if you know Mandarin, right? You see Mandarin written on it, you see it, you read it, and you learn it. Yeah, still, but if you see a language which you have not seen before, you see alphabets. Hindi and English, both. Okay, and therefore you are saying they are motivated, a five-year kid is motivated to be able to self-learn. Okay? Fine. Yeah? Could you speak a little louder, please? Hello? Uh, uh. Yeah, yeah. Um, hire, hire te um, use the money given to children to hire a teacher that okay. can speak so English. Okay, so hire 200,000 more teachers, right? Yes, you can hire 200,000 more teachers. However, that will definitely not fit in anywhere close to a dollar per child per annum, right? So you'll have to pay $10,000 to a teacher per annum and teaching only 30 children so it's not going to work. <clears throat> Hire some teachers to teach the teachers. So like some okay, teachers speak. Okay, so teach the teachers, right? Yeah, speak English and Indian. Yeah, teach the teachers to speak English, and they in turn do that, right? Now, a lot of experiments on this has happened, that people have tried to teach the teachers to teach the children, and they have not worked. Reason is because English is not their natural language. So how many days can you teach a teacher? Three days, five days, 10 days, right? That's it. So can you teach English to a teacher in 10 days? The answer is no. That is the reason all the teach the teacher experiments have failed in languages. So teach the teacher can only work when you want to enhance the skill from level A to level two, but not from level zero to level one. So the idea is good. But at least, see, what you're saying is we are exercising our muscle and moving forward to a solution. I'm sure we're going to hit the solution. I'm almost with the shape here. Uh, I have two questions. So one, is radio available? You said electricity is in there, but is there radio? Uh, radio and electricity? I'm sorry, uh, yes. what's the question? Um, okay, anyways, um, another thing, uh, have students who've already, who know English, who are about the grade five, to intern in these villages, because it's an internship and they're learning in the same process, and teach the students and teach, or like teach one student who teaches the rest of the students. Something of that sort. So, uh, sorry, so go, go with that idea again. So have interns of students itself. Okay. So students who already know English and the regional and language. Go, go to. Come to the place and yeah. teach the students. Yeah. And because the students are smaller, they can learn and pick up easier and they can talk in both the languages. Plus it's an internship. So for six months, you can have new students keep coming in. So the dollar amount, I don't think will make a big difference because it's an internship. Okay, that's a great idea. So the problem with this idea is, so A, that's a great idea and that has been adopted. So there are 10,000 such interns who are coming into villages and teaching, good. However, it's not sustainable because these guys are not fully committed. So they will come and teach A, B, C, D and then when the second guy comes to have teaching that we are not ABCD, but we are going to teach English through phonics, that guy is not a trained teacher. So you can take volunteers to a certain extent, but the volunteers don't know how to teach English. There is a difference between knowing English and teaching English. So teaching English is a little more complicated. So yes, the volunteers can assist, but that is not the core solution. Yes, it fits into the dollar rule, but that will not solve the problem. That will move the needle a little, but not where we want to go. Can we try? combined, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then we'll go, I think somebody back here too. There was somebody out there who raised the hand. Do you want to um, pick out, sorry? Yeah, there, there's somebody there. What if somebody wrote a very interactive, um, like very helpful, well-written, like almost book that you could distribute to every teacher that would phonetically and grammatically teach the teachers the languages that they could review throughout the year on their own, where the books would be a cheap enough price, where then the teachers could be, could be learning just one step ahead of the students and then teaching and going through, with, through them like exercises and things like that that would be laid out clearly in the book? Yeah, so A, that's a good solution, and it's you know consistent with what 
what he was talking about. But imagine a constraint where such books already exist, because that is a child's book, right? So a child's uh, book, when, when in kindergarten you get that book, that is the book. If teacher was interested, she would have read that book. But it's like this, twinkle, twinkle, little star can be said as twinkle, twinkle, gubri, rera. Right? Or twinkle, twinkle, little star. So how does a teacher know twinkle, twinkle, little star? So, sure, that's a problem. So you are right in terms of you're proceeding to that solution. You move the needle, but not the complete way. Build a? For some uh, master in education or PhD in education, like a lot of PhD or uh, graduate student in major university and who is majoring in education, let them build a program that they can just exercise what, what they learn in the village kind of like volunteer, but they are better at teaching. Okay, comparing so all to the B ed programs make it mandatory for them to go to villages and or teach? It, or you can connect this program with some company that they want to do some CSR. Right, CSR, then, yeah, okay. That, it's, a, it's a good idea, but once again, sustainability, right? A teacher-student relationship, you must remember, is not just about knowledge, it's also about a relationship. So you're right in terms of we will make some progress, which is adding to that volunteer program, right? But we will not move the needle because you want to learn over the full year period from the same teacher with whom you have a trust-based relationship. Because the child of five years or 10 years doesn't go to school to learn. Goes to school to have a relationship with that teacher because then ma'am, the teacher is very, very important to that person at that time. And if I, if I yeah, go ahead. Sorry, so yeah. uh, I guess my, my idea would be to use the, the 10,000 interns that you have roaming through the 50,000 or 200,000 teachers and kind of sit, sit them down and let, let them leverage their expertise in English and let the 200 teachers that they're in charge of, or 20 teachers that they're in charge of, uh, use their leverage, leverage their expertise in teaching their kids and teach their relationships and almost so create it, like a pair. It's, it's an extension of the same idea, but if I were to say that the final answer, the true answer to this question was said in this audience. The answer came in this audience and that person then moved away from that answer. So the true answer, the true innovation idea did come, but you did not have the self-belief to take that answer forward. So if you go through that, the answer did appear here and then you suddenly lost it, you said it, then in mid-sentence you dropped it. Yes, go on. Yes. <laughs> right, okay, now let's develop that, right? How can we make a TV cost low? What can we do with a TV? What is the most important aspect? So, all of us are very clear that this is not a human problem, right? Through volunteers, through PhD students, we can't solve it. Are we clear? Yes, no? Yeah. Right, okay. So therefore, we have to bring technology in. Now let's bring technology in. Now, what is the first element of the technology? So now let's build a system, which is going to cost a dollar, right? So let's build this system. So what is the first aspect of this, this technology which is going to be the most crucial in the environment which I'm talking about? Battery. Right? So battery. Which battery is available in volume and therefore very low cost? No, battery. I means cell batteries, right? Cell phone batteries. Huge numbers, very low cost. So we have the cell battery now in place, low cost, and those fat batteries because we are not worried about a cell phone size because the amount of work which has been done on battery. So we have this cell battery, okay. Now we got the battery in place. And that battery in place can easily charge a device depending on how much power we want to consume. Now we have to develop a, a device which will consume less power. Remember, our constraint is the battery. We can charge the battery, let's say, once in seven days. Let's make that assumption. So therefore, we can only use, consume as much power as the battery will last for seven days. So what would that device be? Yes. Audio player. Very good. 
So why an audio player? Fantastic. So now we have got a battery and we have got an audio player. What else do we need? Now you realize your mistake? What else do we need? Yeah, go on. A large loudspeaker sort of thing. No, 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 it's okay. The audio, let's not make it loudspeaker. The audio is an audio. We got a battery, we got an audio system. What else do you need? We need content, right? Now let's develop the content. What is the innovation on content? Innovate on content. Now you've got the device, you've got the battery, you've got the device, you've got the innovation. Now innovate on the content. What is the most innovative? Because otherwise, teachers listening to the, I mean, the students listening to this audio device is not even television, is not attractive. So how will you make that interesting? Um, like songs or stuff Good, songs. Okay, songs, one, what else? Games uh, on their own? Uh, like something that's fun enough, maybe. Give me, give me an example of a game. Like, uh, I don't know, patty cake. Huh? Patty cake? What is that? Patty cake, patty cake, baker. Like, you're learning the word. That right? So, a rhyme. A rhyme. Right? Or a game also. Stay with that thought. There are games which. Remember who is the teacher now? Audio. Audio. Okay. Fantastic. So, what about the story? Develop it further. What story? What kind of stories? Sorry? Folklores. Folklores which they are used to, told in English and their local language. Yes? So, sorry? Same, same idea you were giving. Yes. Now, so we got stories, we got rhymes, we got games. One more thing we need of this device for the children to accept it. What is that? So we, we got stories, we got rhymes. What are the teachers, what are the students expecting to be taught by a teacher? So how do you make this a teacher? Puppet, who said that? Yes, why did you say puppet? By giving it identity. So you have to give it an identity of a teacher. So you need to give it an identity. So you give that device an identity, a voice, a name, maybe a Bollywood name, maybe a Hollywood name, combine games, stories, rhymes, songs, in that battery, which actually lasts six months, with the audio device, and this whole device put together, cost 72 cents. That's it. That is your solution. Now, did you see how this solution came about? And I'm sure if you apply your mind, we will come up with better solutions. So this was the English solution. Similarly, we developed a math solution, and this is the way we went on. OK, what else do you want to talk about? Any questions? Was it fun? Yeah, yeah? good. OK. So once you have a solution in place on paper, like, okay, so we just thought of a solution, right? Now, how do you start rolling it out in such a, on such a huge scale? Basically? You guys are awesome. I'm telling you, and I'm saying this, that the similar exercise I did at the Harvard Business School, and they stopped here, and they didn't ask that question. So let me, let me give you a long answer before I give that, because you need to remember, Idea is what I call 5% of success. The person's capability is 10 to 15% of success. Execution is 75% of success. And if you do not think of innovation in execution, not just execution, innovation in execution, it will fail. So you have the box, innovative. You have the man who has the money and can spend $3 million per annum, okay. 
But execution, innovation execution is key. Now, do you want to develop it along with me? Yeah, right? OK, let's go. So constraints. See, the beauty of innovation is constraints. If there were no constraints, there is no innovation. So what is the constraint? The constraints are that all the schools are government schools. They are not your schools. You can't create them. Right? The government or the politicians are not interested in education. Why? Who cares? Right? There are many other things to do. So the government is not interested, the teachers are not interested, the administrators are not interested. So the only person who's interested is who? You. So you have this beautiful device, you have this $3 million, and you have the interest. Tell me what will you do to execute? Where do you begin? Uh, find other people who have the money or what? No, no, you have the expertise. We just collectively develop the expertise. Yes. Uh, 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 no, no, okay. How, how, okay, okay, let's develop this. How do you proceed the government? So you have a meeting which is going to last 10, who is the most important person in a, in a government? The head, right? The head hancho. It could be the prime minister, the chief minister. Let's call him the head of the state, the governor of the state. You have a 10 minute meeting with him. What do you say to convince him? Tell me, tell me, don't pitch it to me. I'm the governor. Pitch, pitch. I wish I was, but pitch. <laughs> pitch, pitch, pitch. Take, take a shot. Okay. If you educate your children to learn how to speak English, we educate already. Okay. But there's nothing in it for me. Okay, now let's develop this. Now, how, how, how? Connect, you're right. Connect, 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 you got. Now you got my attention, right. So now tell me, how will I get reelected? Tell the parents, like their children are like more educated. Okay, like, develop, India, develop, develop. Like, no, good, good, good. Now you have. Better country, etc. Yes, okay, help develop, yes, go. If the government is not interested, other parents would be interested. So have the parents demand from the governor, and if the governor accepts, Three million pa parents, how will you reach to them? Three million parents in rural villages, how will they, A, you get to them, B, convince them, C, they, got, they form their opinion, and they have one voice, difficult. Again, time, impact, your idea should have less time, higher impact. So let's just be with the chief minister. How can you get him reelected? Okay, simple, Just keep it simple. Um, you would just say that it makes you look better if you're investing in things like education? No, no, make him look better. Not by Joyce or Madhur's statement. Make him look better. Yes, go. Sorry? <laughs> okay, who else? Yes. Make a puppet of the president. Get him re-elected. Why can't you get him re-elected? Yes. Uh, uh, it's not true. Huh? Yes, OK. Put his picture on it. So imagine the power of a chief minister speaking to 3 million children every day. Which chief minister will say no to it? Will somebody say no to it? OK. But you don't want to do it because it's not good for children. So we thought of it, but didn't do it. <laughs> right? So now let's develop. So there is an answer. Yes, now that we have discovered there is a way of convincing the chief minister. Do you agree with me? We have not discovered it yet. So one is, we will get you to speak to 3 million children every day. OK, what's the next one? In the end, the logic is you will get re-elected. Come on. 
What should the children do? Uh, that's a very long term. OK, if the election is coming in 24 months' time, how will you help the chief minister to get elected? No, 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 no. We, we, came, we came to that idea. We could have given the chief minister an opportunity. Uh, maybe ask them to tell their parents to vote for the chief minister uh, No, that's, that's very, no, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. So develop it. How do you show that the minister take cares for the? So now, now let's frame this argument. Very good. Okay. So we have said. We, so the objective number one. Let me just frame it and then give me an answer. Right. Objective one. We have to convince the chief minister you'll get re-elected. Objective number two is the only way we can do that is for the parents to see the chief minister looking good. It's a chief minister initiative, which the parents are proud of. So now we need to do something which the kids do for the parents to see and feel proud of that the chief minister has got done. So that three million children, three million parents convert to three million votes because their children are doing stuff which they never thought would ever be possible. Yes. Uh, two years, two years. Somebody was, I, yes. Ah, uh, dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. What happened? No, no, no. Okay, develop it. Uh, develop it, develop it. Why, why? And in what language? English. Fantastic. So imagine three million children performing one politically sensitive play in every single village in English. <laughs> now, will the chief minister get re-elected? I don't know. But the, did the chief minister buy it? Yes, four of them. <laughs> and they have thrown everything behind this program. So that is not the answer to full execution. but. The first step is the innovation on the execution is first get the key hancho by asking the question, what is it in it for you? Which is how we started the session. What do you want to hear? It's not what I want to say. What do you want? So dear chief minister, what do you want? You want to get elected. Okay, so now chief minister is handled. Now similarly, we have answers for the teachers and you know, so we can spend all night here if we go and develop this. But that is the innovation. We just developed it. Yes. How do you keep it sustainable if they don't get elected? How do you keep it sustainable when they don't get elected? Very good. Now, who will answer that? So assuming this is implemented, right? That is an assumption. The chief minister was very happy. It is implemented. How do we sustain it? Chief minister has changed. What well, would be the guy that took us such a sustainable program? Okay. What else? So what, let's go back to the classroom. What is happening in the classroom? The device is teaching whom? Sorry? Who is the device teaching? The children. Yes or no? Are you sure? And the? In two years, what would happen to the teacher? Would she need the device? That's it, end of story, sustainability. Who needs the chief minister after two years? <laughs> You're done. The device is for the teacher. In the transaction which is happening between the teacher and the student, the teacher is learning, and after two years, she will throw the device out because she will see the device as a threat. And we are fine. We are absolutely fine because she can say twinkle, twinkle, little star in approximately the right <laughs> tone. And then we'll go to the next three million, the next three million, because our goal is to reach. It's very funny. When I started Sampark Foundation, we had this tagline, which is quite stupid, creating a million smiles. 
After three years, we are trying to change, creating three million smiles, now creating 10 million smiles. Okay, what else do you want to talk about? I don't know if we have time. Now it is? Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is fun, but I would love it if you could give us some insight into how this works when you don't already know the answer. Is it just you and the you know people working on this project sitting around in a room for 15 minutes going, no, 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 yes? Or is it a longer process? Are you interviewing people? Are you talking to stakeholders? Are you really just brainstorming from your own knowledge and trying to free your own mind from constraints? Like, how does this actually play out before you know the answer? Okay. So, I don't know the answer, but I have a formula which has worked for me, which I'll share with you. So, the way to innovation is a three-step process. Step one is to be extremely unhappy with your status quo, right? that I will not accept computers in the class, I will fix one dollar, right? Whatever the constraint is. So just firebrand the constraint and saying I'm not gonna move out. So I'm not gonna change the constraint just because I can't find the solution. Normally what really happens is because you struggle to find the solution, because all solutions outside the boundaries of logic and reason are very difficult. So what you do is you come back and change the parameters on the basis of which you, so first is fix it, and that is what I call the state of unhappiness, that I'm not happy till I find something completely uniquely different, right? So that's step one. Step two is to create a vision for tomorrow which is so compelling, so big, that it is worth attempting to go from here to there. So if you are saying, how do we, how do we innovate in teaching 100 students, I will not apply the energy which is required, right? Most people will not. But the moment you define this vision, there are 186 million children out in government schools, if we can innovate, we can reach to 186 million children in India and about 100 million in Africa and blah, blah, blah. Suddenly the vision is so big that it, it energizes a lot of people to apply their mind to it. So now you have, we will not accept status quo. We are energized to do something different. The step from here to there is a series of hypothesis formation and experimentation. Right, which happens day in, day in, day in, day in. It, it, you know, it's, it's not you sit in a, within 15 minutes you come with a solution. No, you think of the first step, then you think of the second step, then you experiment, then you fail, then you succeed, then you frame another hypothesis. So it's a series of experiments. It's constantly execution, constantly pursuing, and constantly wanting to innovate. You fail 70% of the time, you succeed 30% of the time, and then try more, and try more, and try more, and try more, and that's how you reach an inner. So innovation looks good in hindsight, but in foresight, it's a lot of hard work of small, 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 small steps in pursuit of that big vision, because it's very energizing, not willing to give up on the constraints, and attempting to move from here to there relentlessly without stopping. That's how, in my belief, innovation happens. You mentioned that uh, like all of us like came up with the right idea at some point, but then we just threw it away. How do you like train yourself to not throw away the right idea when you have it? Which is, which is what happened is that right now it's a class, so you have an option. Right? Like, right now, that's what he was alluding to. It's like a game. Right? Now, real innovation is not like a game. That's the reason I said the first step is constraint. You hard box the constraint. Once you hard box the constraint, then you, there is no going back. Then it is relent, then one idea. So all the ideas we discussed, maybe they are all the wrong ideas and maybe there are sets of new ideas. So right now, if I meet you a year later, I said all the stuff which we discussed actually didn't work, something else worked. So you hardwire constraint, and leave the path, jump out. Once you jump out, the vision should be so compelling that it is worth jumping out. If the vision is not compelling, then it's not worth jumping out. So when it is worth jumping out, then you will swim. It's like, you know, jump and then start swimming, and you'll start swimming. Otherwise, what will happen is when you have choices, you move. So you have to give yourself, and you have to choose the right time for it. 
right? It's not today you have to do it. And that's the reason I said, if you remember, you have to exercise your muscle. So once you exercise your muscle, and then one day it'll come that, hey, this is the time I want to do it. So in 1993, when this, you know, IP was coming in and Cisco was just getting formed, I saw this opportunity and said, this is it. I just quit. So, but it was after six years, out of, you know, I, six years I did a job, and after six years I saw this opportunity, which I couldn't refuse. And then it took us three years to get our first <laughs> dollar of revenue. So those are difficult times, but the reason you pursue it is because it's, you know, it's so compelling that you don't want to give up. And then all nighters and everything, all the pains is worth it. That is the reason it is this three-step process. Uh, at this point, when you started off, how were you able to evaluate that your thing was working, that the children were actually learning? How did you go about this process of figuring out that this was a really good model that was working out? Yeah, so it is that, uh, that's simple. It's a pilot program, right? So we did 5,000, 50,000, 500, 5,000, 50,000. 500 schools, 5,000, 500 schools we, we did without telling anybody. No chief minister dis discussion. 5,000 schools to show to the chief minister it works. 50,000 schools after it works. Schools initially, how were you assessing the kids? Was there a, was the play or like was, what was the end result that No, you... no, no, the play was to no. on the execution side. Yeah. No, 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 that, those things came later. Our first objective was, does this device, and we have not even talked about the maths program. Maths program is equally very interesting. Uh, so does this device and the maths program result into learning outcomes, improvement? That was our first test. And that test took us almost two years to, to get it right. Once we got that right, all, not right, almost right, because it's never right, almost right, then the question is, how do I get the execution going? So the 500 schools was the, where we got these two concepts right. So we have time for one or two more questions. So you can go ahead. Um, yeah, one question that I had is sort of how do you decide which, which ideas and which problems to go for? Because there are so many impossible seeming problems out there. But how do you know, how have you found the decision between going after education versus going after, I don't know, uh, poverty or something like that? So, uh, so there are two answers. First is I'll give you a personal answer and then maybe what is the right answer for you. I go after problems I can solve rather than problems that interest me. Because I'm interested in problems, not where the problems are. So people say, are you interested in education or water? I said, I'm interested in anything I can solve. It doesn't matter where it is. Because I'm excited about problems, especially if they are large scale. So if poverty and hunger is a large scale problem, if I can solve it, I'll go after it. But I can't solve it because there is nothing which is coming to my mind that I can solve it with an innovation at that dollar, so I'm not solving it. It's not that I'm attracted to one problem or another problem. Therefore, my recommendation to all of you is that, yes, you should be excited with all kinds of problems which you see around you, but you should be more excited about the way you're solving it. So the decision to go and take a decision to solve a problem is after you've figured out at least the trajectory which you are going to follow to solve it. For example, we went after this after we discovered that actually this device could be an interesting way of doing it, especially when we can put a Bollywood star voice in it, give it a, you know, all that stuff. So once we discovered that little thought, then we said, let's go for it. And now that program is going for adult literacy. See, now that I've figured this out, I'm going to take that device to adult literacy. I'm going to take that device to health and hygiene. I'm going to take that. So that device is going to be the source of trying to solve. So that's a core innovation. But that core innovation happened accidentally because we kept on applying our mind. We did all kinds of stay, and this state. So the question is, the moment you find a solution, then you apply it. Otherwise, the problems are too many. Is that your personal and your uh, right answer? No, no. I said, yeah, actually, it's, it's both. But for the problem I have, so one of the things I do is I invest in a lot of startups, right? So that's the other exciting part which I do. 
And everybody comes in very excited with their ideas. Right? Very, I'm hugely excited about it. And I ask them, what problem are you trying to solve? They are very clear, what problem are you trying to solve? And when I ask them, why are you trying to solve this problem? They don't have an answer. So that is my test question. Why are you solving this problem? Why are you not solving this problem? And I'm wanting to hear because of the innovation in the way I'm trying to solve the problem. So innovation is not the problem. So everybody comes and tells me, because A and B can't meet each other, therefore we can make A and B meet. No. Because I have this unique algorithm, that is the innovation. The innovation is not the problem that A and me have never thought about meeting. No, that's not, that somebody else can take you for a ride later. But that I have a unique algorithm which will make all A's and B's in the world meet. So the uniqueness is here, the uniqueness is not in the problem. And that is, that is what I would recommend as a way to go about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.